three. Hello, and thank you for clicking into CPR's YouTube channel. I'm Russ Bleemer, and I write and edit alternatives to the high cost of litigation for the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution, the CPR Institute. I'm here to wrap up the 2023-2024 U.S. Supreme Court term, still in session for another month as we gather and wait. Big decisions coming on presidential immunity, two abortion access cases, two gun cases. But at CPR and Alternatives here on YouTube, we are focused on the arbitration cases. And this year, the court took and decided three of them. I am honored to be joined by Philip J. Lurie Jr. from New York's Lurie Law Firm, Angela Downs, University of North Texas at Dallas College of Law. She's a professor of practice and assistant director of experiential education. That's in Dallas. And Richard Faulkner, a Dallas-based solo attorney, arbitrator, mediator. I want to thank this crowd right up top. <clears throat> They're really busy people. We greatly appreciate, on behalf of all of CPR, they're taking the time to join us. They are so busy, they forgot that our anniversary passed last week. We have been doing these for more than four years as of this week. Uh, the anniversary wow. was uh, then. So thank you both for coming back and doing these analysis videos as the needs come up. Um, if you haven't seen these before, we're really in the weeds here. But thanks to the U.S. Supreme Court, distinct practice takeaways abound in the arbitration caseload. Uh, in that caseload, it has taken not only over these past four years, but the past four decades. And we're going to wrap up the three from this term. I've got uh, a couple of quick lines on, on each. I'll sum up and then we'll return to each of them and, and we'll pass around some comments. But very quickly, in chronological order. On April 12th, in a Federal Arbitration Act case, and in a unanimous opinion written by Chief Justice John G. Roberts Jr., Bissonnette, Bissonnet versus LePage Bakeries Park Street, LLC. Quite a mouthful. In Bissonnet, the court said, well, very simply, a transportation worker need not work in the transportation industry to be exempt from coverage under FAA Section 1. It was an interpretation of Federal Arbitration Act Section 1, and in, in, in that section exempts arbitration contracts of transportation workers. The court in the case simply declined to hold that those workers must be in a traditional transportation industry. It's the jobs. It's not the business. Earlier this month, May 16th, Smith versus Baziri, another 9-0 unanimous Federal Arbitration Act case. Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote that in a plain text interpretation of the Federal Arbitration Act, when a district court finds that a lawsuit involves an arbitrable dispute and a party has requested a stay of the court proceeding pending arbitration, the Federal Arbitration Act under Section 3 compels the court to issue a stay. The court uh, does, uh, lacks the discretion and cannot dismiss the suit. So it's a, a plain reading of, of FAA Section 3 requiring a stay. Finally, most recently, on May 23, in another third unanimous 9-0 opinion, Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson in Coinbase versus Susky, uh, the court affirmed the Ninth Circuit, U U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. It, it held, quote, reading right from the case where the parties have agreed to two contracts, one sending arbitrability disputes to arbitration and the other explicitly or implicitly sending arbitrability disputes to the courts, a court must decide which contract governs. There was one slight difference in this Susky, Coinbase versus Susky case. There was another opinion. Neil Gorsuch filed a concurrence focusing like the main opinion on contract principles. Um, summaries of the decisions and everything that preceded them, including coverage of the oral arguments that led to this point, is available at the CPR Speaks blog. That is linked below here. So we have three cases, 27 votes for, none against. In the arbitration world, there is no such thing as, uh, as um, uh, divergent opinions and factionalizing. There is a thoroughly united Supreme Court. The problem with all of this isn't the decisions themselves, at least I don't think so. We'll find out shortly. But the narrow grounds the court takes these cases on and then forces itself to decide. They leave this now just short of a hundred year old statute, the Federal Arbitration Act, with more nuanced questions that history shows parties are only too willing to litigate. For a one quick example, that last case, Coinbase, was argued to the court in the previous term. And its companion case, another arbitration case, was decided. The, the case that was decided requires litigation stays while appeals of a denial of arbitration are made under FAA Section 3. Really, this is in the same wheelhouse as the Smith and Spaziri case, 
that was just decided this term that I just mentioned. The Coinbase case on the two contracts, the one that was just decided here, was actually dismissed on June 23rd, is improvidently granted by the Supreme Court in that first Coinbase FAA decision. It was back on the docket by November 3rd. It just decided in the past 10 days. The result is that arbitration still breeds lit litigation. It's going to continue to do so. That's pretty obvious for practitioners and everybody sit, sit, sitting here on YouTube, though it may not be to the general public and even the general legal community. The question is, what do arbitration practitioners need to take away from these cases and watch closely? Um, let's go around the horn and go back to, we'll start with the first one, uh, again, in chronological order. Bissonnette, transportation worker, does not have to be in the transportation industry to be exempt from arbitration under FAA Section 1. Phil, do you want to take that one on first? What it, what's the implications of that one? It seems really straightforward. It is. And uh, I mean, my takeaway from it is it, it's more evidence that the court has gone pretty strictly textual on, on FAA interpretation issues. I mean, this, from the beginning, I think we, we spoke about this case uh, maybe last year, but it was coming up. But, um, you know, I, I've always seen this as pretty straightforward case. It was, you know, the, the result of which was yeah, was forecast by um, by Justice Thomas uh, in, in 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 last year's opinion on Section One. Um, so it's a textual. This is what it, it. An interesting thing about it, it's a textual decision that it's actually pro employee because it it uh, it's, it interprets more expansively than the employer in the case wanted uh, interpreted section one and you know section one is an exemption so that means you know that 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 more hmm. are exempt from the from the FAA if the court had gone the second circuit route I mean it, it would, F section one would would probably cover almost nobody yeah it, in, interestingly um uh Justice Chief Justice Roberts didn't emphasize plain text. He emphasized the interpretation of Section 1 and what Section 1 does with transportation workers and that whole history, which was what they argued. It, it wasn't uh, until uh, Smith versus, versus Spazieri, Justice Sotomayor really hit on plain text. But the bottom line, as you said, Phil, was exactly the bottom line. This was a plain text decision. They, they literally read us back the... Um, the uh, uh, exemption from from arbitration for transportation workers under Section One. Uh, yeah, and they, and they and they pointed out that that uh, there was nothing in the text to to support this, mm -hmm. and that was always the big thing for me. And I, I mean, went through various machinations of arguments made, etc. But they, in making this decision, they certainly added nothing to the text, and that's to me what makes it more of a textual, plain meaning come. Professor Downs, uh, is there anything you would you would want to highlight from that? Is it going to be a uh, rush to court from Amazon drivers and bakery drivers? In this particular case, this was a separate subsidiary of a uh, a big company that bakes Wonder Bread, and and that subsidiary was kind of a, a delivery service, a transportation yes. service, but it wasn't a traditional transportation industry. Right, not not really aligned with the major company but but a, a, a third party contractor. And I think one of the things that this case shows us is the possibility of protections for those for those third parties, for those subsidiaries, kind of the small, the little guy, if you will, um, no longer being um, shackled, if you will, to the arbitration agreement, but having the option, to go another way, and that is to go away from the FAA in order to have their matters handled another way. So I think this is an opportunity mm. for uh, independent uh, subsidiaries, independent drivers, even Amazon workers, I think are going to stand up and take note of this case because there's an opportunity sure. for folks who are not tied to the company uh, to have their matters heard in another venue. Mm -hmm. And that venue is going to be court. And I really, really think this is going to turn the tide 
because one of the complaints that you hear is that there's no choice and that arbitration is very expensive and that it really doesn't speak to the individual, but more so to the corporate corporate entities, which is not necessarily true. But I think this is going to turn the tide. And I think more of the smaller entities are really going to stand up and take notice of this case. That's interesting. We did want to talk about mass arbitration a little bit later for consumer yeah, contracts. Absolutely. But on the employment side, do, do, do you, you know, if this case was taken 10 years ago, we would have, mm. I think we all probably would have agreed that, that, that those drivers didn't have a chance. It was going to be sent to mm -hmm. arbitration. But again, as Phil pointed out, although this was argued about the history, that, that plain text idea, which we saw from New Prime versus mm -hmm. Oliveira since 2019, right. has come back repeatedly here. And when they took this case, I don't want to speak for you, for everyone, but did we do we kind of agree that this was the way it was going to go? And this is part of a trend, yes. as you're saying? I think so. I, I think, think so. We, we've kind of, the, the the issue has presented itself kind of over and over again. Mm -hmm. And there's finally a decision yeah. that has been made. So I think it's something that, that we finally have something that we can really sink our teeth into and that others are going to be able to to stand up and take notice of for sure. And uh, I'd yeah. add something to uh, that uh, if uh, please. And that is uh, I recently attended the Federalist Society Corporate Council program and Amazon loudly announced to everybody that it was abandoning arbitration. And I think oh, you're wow. about to see <laughs> more and more companies uh, take a step back and look and see, do we really want to arbitrate? Is it worthwhile? Is the cost and the inefficiency of the process really something that the company wants to do? Rick, to and be clear, was this in the employment context? Is that what they were talking this about? This was in the context of consumers. And, and consumer, uh, on the consumer, because yeah. they do have this transportation issue. They have this yes. FAA Section 1 exemption issue for sure. And they filed well, an absolutely. amicus brief in the case as well, uh, uh, indicating that while they uh, they were not a transportation company, they were an Internet company. Uh, and there was a bit of an exchange over those uh, uh, large trucks that I think we all see on the highways. But what I was going to say is, uh, one of the things that surprised me was the number of corporate lawyers, both in-house and outside counsel, who were expressing serious reservations about arbitration, and some of whom, uh, which we can't give, you know, make any attribution to, flatly said class action in federal court was preferable to arbitrations now. And I didn't think I'd ever hear that out of effectively, you know, defense and management oriented firms. Uh, but uh, as we're seeing, and we're going to address later on with Samsung, there are some real problems, not just those experienced by consumers, but also now small and mid-sized businesses are finding arbitration to be very questionable. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to point out uh, this isn't in isolation. I had mentioned New Prime, but also last year's Southwest case in Chicago yes. had to deal with transportation workers as well and their status and what they do. This case does seem to be an expansion of that. Another situation where the employee won. I, I think we're, we're, we're all agree. And I do want to move on, on to the next one that that, that case is more influential that, than the next one, which was Smith versus Spaziri. It was the second one who's decided. This seems like a court docket management case. Again, it was 9-0, it was unanimous. And Sotomayor, again, uh, explicitly a plain language interpretation of Section 3 in the FAA. Uh, there's a lawsuit, there's an arbitral dispute, and the party under Section 3 has requested a stay. The Ninth Circuit dismissed, and the court says, that's not what Section 3 says. You're going mm -hmm. to keep it going. It is not going to be dismissed and it will keep the case under management. Is there anything we need to be worried about here? It certainly could change the motion practice of some firms in the circuits that allow dismissal like the ninth. Yeah, I think it's certainly going to affect the, the number of, the, uh, well, not necessarily the number, but the, the length of time it takes to, to uh, resolve arbitration related appeals that in conjunction also with the coinbase one case uh, 
which was decided last term and had to do with stay of uh, um, litigation pending appeal, which is on the flip side of what we have here. So with those two combined, you, you know, you're, you're, it's you're appealing one of these you know, a pro, a pro or, a, or a con arbitration decision is, um, you know, it takes time and it, and uh, it didn't, and the, certainly the litigation though will will won't will not be allowed to proceed until the all the issues are are resolved. I it, the only thing I I think in terms of your um, conclusion about it being kind of a just basically procedural case is is, is on the mark. Uh, there is something, uh, there is language in the, in the opinion that refers to the FAA having, um, providing mechanisms for courts to play a supervisory role yes. with respect to. And there is, this hasn't gotten a lot of attention, although we've written about it in alternatives. Um, there, there is a split in the circuits now as to whether if, if you have a federal suit for which there is federal question jurisdiction and a, a motion to compel arbitration is made whether you know later on somebody can come back with a motion to confirm and file it in that same action and and expect the court to have subject matter jurisdiction we call that anchor jurisdiction or continuing jurisdiction um the uh, the court did not resolve that issue i didn't think that they would but they they there was some language in the in the opinion that suggests that they would be um that they would certainly take that kind of argument seriously i know that it does have a lot of uh, support in um in in pre badgero decisions as well um and it's uh it 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 I think overall it just makes sense, and you can give have the jurisdiction to stay in, in, in arbitration until it's uh, concluded. Then, mm -hmm. well, it really isn't concluded until the motion to confirm or the motion to vacate is uh, is, is decided. And, Phil, and Phil does uh, Phil does a great job on these motion practice issues in two successive articles and alternatives in the April and May issues. You can email me. And we'll link to it. You can email me at alternatives at cpradr.org if you're watching this, and we can get you those articles that lay out this very important procedural issue. I should apologize. It's kind of dismissive. These are all procedural cases. That's the nature <laughs> of the FAA. But this in particular has an effect, this hypersensitive issue of where and when exactly, Phil, to file that motion for a stay yeah. or or where to go and how to go for confirming sure. or vacating. And it makes a big difference if you end up in yeah. state court versus federal court. Yeah. I mean, you probably uh, employees and consumers are better off in state court and larger corporations uh, are better off in federal court. So all, all those things come into the mix. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, there, there's a lot of ways to spin it as a win, depending on on on, on your yeah. perspective and also. So th th this will well, uh, uh, Professor Downs uh, on these videos has talked a lot about drafting and all. Did you when you saw Smith versus Spaziri, did you think of any drafting considerations that came out? Is there any anything that uh, you would throw in a contract because of this one? Or is this more for the litigation and the motion and the court calendar people? You know, I think that it does. There's some drafting issues that need to be included as part of the consideration of this case as you examine it. I mean, always you want to have clear drafting in whatever that, you know, whatever you're putting forth, because if you can get it right on the front end, obviously that will save you on the back end. Mm -hmm. um, so as, you know, it's, as I tell my students, you want to be as clear as you can with anything that you're drafting on the onset Absolutely. because it's so much more difficult to try to go back and to clean the clean things up or to fix things um, that have been misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. So I think what Phil is saying and what I'm saying with, and with relation to drafting go hand in hand, because if we can make things clearer initially, then that might defer or delay or even stop some of the, the motion gamesmanship that, that, um, you know, that, that people do with some of these cases. Mm -hmm. 
Um, maybe it's getting easier as we go along. But as I move to, to, to Coinbase versus Susky, which is the third decision, uh, another 9-0, um, again, the, where the parties have agreed to two contracts, in this case, Coinbase had a customer agreement, standard customer agreement, standard arbitration clause, um, sent it to arbit ar sent the determination of arbitrability to arbitration, and then it had a sweepstakes. And that had a whole bench <laughs> bunch of rules, and the venue precision <laughs> sent it to court. The, 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 the decision, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at this and thinking of all the nuances that could happen, and we sure. discussed some of it here. The decision, yeah. the decision that Justice Jackson wrote on behalf of the unanimous court seems incredibly common sense. This is a contract case, and the contract yes. governs. Read the contracts and, and figure it out. Uh, so is it? it for all of that, the Coinbase two here probably a little less influential than the other two. I don't know. We got mm -hmm. some nice words about the law dictionary and all in this opinion and about contract construction. What do you all think of that? I actually was more more impressed with it. Um, to me, I mean, we, we it, it's an extension of first options. Uh, you know, first options right. laid out. The, there were three uh, disputes that were that you see in arbitration uh, practice, and one is disputes about the merits, right? Another is disputes about who about arbitrability, um, the scope making of the arbitration agreement, the validity and enforceability of such an agreement, and third was the disputes about who gets to decide issues that fall within that category too. And this court had a and we struggled with this. I know, you know, to me, it just seemed like because you had these two obvious conflicts, it, that there couldn't be any clear and unambiguous agreement or clear and unmistakable agreement to arbitrate arbitrability in this circumstance. So we would, and, and that would, re would reach the same result as the court did. But yeah. I think I like the way the court did it because the court, the court, yeah. it, it took it out of that matrix that we were kind of stuck in. And every time I got stuck in the matrix, I would always think, well, what about the fact you have this, you know, um, delegation agreement, which is supposed to be a separate antecedent agreement. And well, you know, if that's valid, then why the heck aren't we sending this to arbitration? You know, and then you can say, and, you know, I, I, that was an issue, a similar issue came up in the Shine 2 case. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are complicated issues. And I think the court has done something which may well um make it more understandable and i, I want to this one i want to give to rick because he he mentioned the dissent the gorse such a sense of, and so um he, he did like yeah which and, and it implicates infinite arbitration so i i hand it over to rick and angela to kind of you know look yeah, at that pick aspect up with, of it I, yet again my drafting in rena center versus jackson continues to have life uh and you know we're now arguing uh about these things uh that is the, just to do a little a little context rick we'll bring it forward what phil's yeah. saying we've been wrestling with this delegation clause is and again it's a simple mm -hmm. question who decides and it does seem like the court simplified it i do want to clarify very important there was no dissent in this case remember we have a right. perfect record right. here yes. for, right. for right. 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 it was a concurrence yes. it was My a concurrence problem. by Ju justice yeah. um gorsuch and it seemed very plain spoken about contract law principles mm -hmm. as the main opinion did but but Rick saw something in it, as as Phil just said, that 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 shook him uh, to his core, maybe. Yeah, and continues. <laughs> what to. was it? What I saw was a reference to a master agreement that could, in fact, address future agreements between the parties, and so that seems to be opening up an entire problem area, which uh, Professor Horton described as the infinite arbitration issue, which is. Can someone agree that they will forever be bound to arbitrate disputes with an entity or like AT&T tried some years ago, an entity that was acquired in the future? Mm -hmm. And these issues are a problem and it gets back in part to drafting. Does a business or whoever is drafting really and truly want to give arbitrability to the arbitrators? Because remember, you're giving them an open check uh, on the company treasury. And when you look at the fact that you have one, typically one person, 
deciding arbitrability. Is that, in fact, what the companies really and truly wanted to do? If it is, fine. But most of the time, this ends up being addressed on the backhand by either the JAMS rule on arbitrability, which just caused some issues uh, in a decision yesterday out of the Fifth Circuit, now finding class action arbitration is an issue of arbitrability for the JAMS arbitrator. Not exactly what the company in that case intended to have happen. We've got a number of cases with the AAA's language on delegation of arbitrability to the arbitrators, which in matters like uh, uh, Doe versus Rena Center, the consumer would have, have would have to go through multiple layers in a click-through contract to find the reference to the AAA rules and then understand what the delegation uh, language meant, which is completely implausible. Uh, most lawyers have issues with this. We've been discussing it now for many years. Yes. And what consumer understands what Rule 7 of the AAA rules really mean? So it's a huge problem. Uh, drafting can address it by spe uh, specifying Yes, the arbitrator will determine arbitra uh, delegation and arbitrability, or no, they will not. And, you know, there's been a real issue, too, about the self-interest and the financial self-interest of arbitrators in making these decisions. But well, Gorsuch the point, the, Rick, I'm sorry, the point the point you seem to make was was Justice Gorsuch didn't seem to think this was a big problem. It just could be not at all. Ar arbitrated. <laughs> uh, it just could be drafted right away. And you could ensure that arbitration will happen now and henceforth down the line and forever. I I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but because we, we, we've we hit Angela with drafting, let me, <laughs> let me ask her if she can answer Rick's question at the beginning. The question was, can you draft a, a contract so that all the successive and uh, ancillary and attendant contracts are going to require arbitration? Is that possible? I, you know, being the eternal optimist, I think anything <laughs> is possible. But going back to this case, there's, you know, Justice Jackson even said that we took this case to decide whether under the Federal Arbitration Act, a court or an arbitrator decides which of the two contractual provisions controls, and we declined to consider auxiliary questions. So they, as a court, are laser focused on what they want to talk about. And it's not yeah. any of the auxiliary questions that we're throwing around. So I think that's yet to be Good decided. Point. So point. I think that, yeah, so I think it's to be decided. We, we you know, I'm going to be an optimist as I am. Um, <laughs> but the court was was very clear in, in what their role was. Uh, and I think it's, to me, it's astounding that these are unanimous decisions. Yes. I, I mean, it's just it's just blown me away that there have been no dissents uh, with these such complex cases. Rick, I'm sorry I cut you off. Do you want to wrap up on that point about the uh, the Gorsuch dissent, the Gorsuch concurrence? <laughs> it, I think Justice Gorsuch uh, telegraphed that, in fact, he is fine with a master agreement that will provide for future arbitration, including potentially the delegation of arbitrability in the future. And what the rest of the court will do is unknown, but that becomes a real issue when you have uh, entities drafting that purport to uh, bind to arbitration an existing party with entities they have not yet, even yet acquired. And that is a problem. I think Justice yes. Gorsuch just said he doesn't see it's a problem, yeah. but it's come up in other cases that I know Phil and I are aware of where the future intervening entity secured a multi-hundred billion dollar award against a company that had no reason to expect that that was even remotely possible, and yet it destroyed $3 billion of shareholder equity. Yes, that sure. gets corporate America's attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's that a great. Big time. Yeah. You know that that's a, that's a great transition to um, you know that a, a good way to wrap up this court year, but a good transition to what we wanted to look ahead to and maybe go out on on a limb. 
um, uh, speaking of shocking awards. Uh, I just wanted to know quickly, the court now, at least as per SCOTUS blog, it just has the arbitration case of Uber Technologies in front of it. That involves uh, what, how, whether and how arbitrable claims remain under the California Private Attorney General's Act. This is a question that was left wide open at the end of the Viking River case a couple of years ago by Samuel Alito. Uh, Sotomayor pointed out as well in a dissent in that case. Um, uh, we have more on, on, the, on that case, Viking River and Paga and all at the CPR Speaks link below. The, the issue, I think we'll all agree, is sure to be back at the Supreme Court, although the exact posture of this case may not be the vehicle. At any rate, that case hasn't been taken yet. There are other arbitration cases that have been appealed. You've heard some references to some new cases that likely will be before the court and will be back in the fall uh, confidently with something that the court has taken. But along the lines uh, of what Rick was just mentioning, these um, uh, huge awards, uh, we were had a side conversation before this. And I think he thinks that the current big issue isn't any of these Supreme Court procedural issues as important as they may be. But the big issue is one is as old as the hills. It's the runaway award, maybe big enough yes. even to plow through the federal courts to get to the nation's top court. The case Rick referenced, uh, we heard it briefly here, was actually two cases. Walgreens, less than two weeks ago, was uh, asked for uh, a $642 million arbitration award against it in favor of Humana. It was a uh, promotional reimbursement case. They want that overturned in the D.C. federal court. That's pending. But but the, the big drug chain also went to federal court in Delaware in March to have, of all things, of all things, a Lanham Act trademark case, arbitration award against it overturned, an arbitration award for a whopping $987 million. Any way you slice it, more than $1.6 billion in arbitration pending talk about damage to stockholders uh mm, um value good. is a lot rick this stuff's happened before we, we've had discussions about yes. arbitration runaway awards in the past there's plenty of safeguards out it but am i correct do you see these walgreen awards as actions as kind of a line in the sand is this something different is this something worse beyond the the magnitude I think the magnitude alone is now going to compel focus on these issues. Uh, this is not the first of these awards. There are other rogue awards. You have several international awards that are, are rogue, including against the government of Malaysia. Uh, and so these are all typically multi-hundred million or billion dollar awards. And let's face it, no one in corporate America allows a single person to make a billion dollar decision. And yet these are being given to AAA arbitrators sitting solo. And it's interesting in the Walgreens case in Delaware, there were challenges to the arbitrator, attempts to remove him, uh, which were administratively denied by the administrator, the AAA. Uh, there were questions about disclosure. I think the court is going to have enough issues relating to that arbitration to perhaps take up uh, one or more of these uh, rogue, potentially rogue awards and decide what exactly are the parameters, how much supervision, going back to an earlier case, do or should the federal courts exercise when it's arguable that the arbitrators have just gone way off the reservation, created their own brand of industrial justice, as the term was once uh, coined, and are coming down with decisions that just are mind-boggling to corporate America. And I have already encountered desires, both from folks that I knew through the Federalist Society and business leaders in Texas, to try to find a way to amend the Texas Arbitration Act to see if we can give some sort of a relief mechanism, perhaps based on what the 1996 Arbitration Act in England does with allowing appeals for errors of law. Does anyone really agree arbitration expecting the arbitrator will get it wrong? Uh, you know, we're anticipating that arbitrators will correctly decide law. Uh, we anticipate that they will not exceed the parameters set out in a contract. And in that Walgreens contract, 
it looks very much like there was a hard cap of $80 million. Mm. So the arbitrator's decision is more than 10 times what uh, Walgreens believed was a cap in the contract. And this is not the first of these agreements to be avoided, evaded, circumvented by creative arbitral award drafting. And we, this we is a real concern. We, we, we arguably have guidance in the most recent opinion from Justice Jackson on reading the contract, reading the arbitration contract to rule on how the arbitration should be conducted. Um, I want to toss this one over to, to Phil and Angela as well. Uh, what More than 1.6 billion, two awards. Is this coming to a head or another head, as Rick seems to agree? Is there something different here? I, I, from my perspective, I, it seems to be a, a growing trend and certainly the numbers are growing and it's not just inflation that's, uh, that's growing that, or if it is, <laughs> never in bad shape. But, um, so it, it's something that we're, we're all watching carefully and I, and, and we're clearly getting a lot of intelligence that the, uh, uh, corporate, uh, you know, general counsels and, and other corporate uh, people are not not happy with 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 this, and it, it does make you kind of rethink uh, your dispute resolution choice, and makes me wonder if if some of the court decisions, you know, that have been so hands off arbitration for all the years, for all these years, or you know, ought, to, ought not to be revisited. I mean, the, the nineteen ninety six Act. I mean, the there's clearly a policy. Um, choice that was made there that you know arbitrate you know legal legal accuracy is important but you know that it's the opposite in the faa it's uh you know everybody makes such a big deal of the arbitrators can do whatever they you know they can make gross errors of law and all all you really need to do after a case like um we had back in uh, two, uh 2013 was um is you know it, 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 as long as you pretend to interpret the contract that it's an interpretation and it, and and you can't vacate the award of the section 10A4. Uh, Phil, that sounds well, like an worse argument. Than that, though, and Russ, and I, I would pick up on part of what Phil said to indicate there's a new court of appeal decision in which the arbitrator found that the agreement to arbitrate between the employee and their employer changed the standard from at-will employment to effectively a just cause termination mm -hmm. and the arbitrator managed to squeak by and get two judges on the court federal court of appeal to decide well you know he may not have interpreted the law right but he didn't do it so wrongly that we can step in and correct it and so you have an arbitrator taking away at will employment which is a critical employment issue across sure. this country mm -hmm. and decided, oh, yeah. well, if you have an agreement to arbitrate, then you're agreeing to a just cause standard. <laughs> yeah, Rick, if I could ask you to send us that, that case. I'd like to see that case too. I'll try to find I it to send it back to y'all. <laughs> and I read about a thousand arbitration <laughs> cases a year, so I'm constantly finding these <laughs> things. Yeah. Rick, like Rick, Rick reads the on interesting appeal. ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, Phil, uh, on, your, on your point, it sounded like you were making an argument for the return of or the revitalization of manifest disregard as a, as a reason for vacating awards under Section 10. Well, not not exactly, but it's certainly related to that. And and I say not exactly because if you you practice mainly in the Second Circuit, you know, manifest disregard of the law is alive and well. It's, yeah. it's, it's, and and the Supreme Court has has refused pretty much to to uh, step in and say that manifest disregard of the law shouldn't exist now i i can i think you know if, if push came to shove and someone was going to make an argument there should be no manifest disregard of the law what do you do if if an arbitrator uh in a statutory rights case says i you know i i know the uh the, you know the, the the plaintiff has rights here but i'm just going to ignore them forget about it 
Yeah. I'm not going to answer that, but Professor <laughs> Downs, do you want to? If you want right. to, feel free. But I did want to get your reaction to the to, and, to the. And how do you square that with war. the other Supreme Court cases yeah, that I, say that that's why you can have statutory arbitration? Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I I think this you know the Walgreens case, the Samsung case are indications that uh, the awards are getting bigger. They're getting more outrageous. Um, I do hope that we will get to a point where we're re-examining um, what arbitrators are doing as far as um, ensuring that they're staying within the confines of what's reasonable with awards and not just, you know, going a a aside because they want to. Um, you know, I'm going to hold hold tight to what Justice Katanji Brown Jackson just did in Coinbase to say we've got to read the contract, mm -hmm. and that's got to rule the day, um, because I think if we continue down this road, um, arbitration is it's not going to be the same uh, dispute resolution as, as we know it. It's going to change, and people are going to demand that change because yeah. the millions and billions of dollars that are at stake are going to change arbitration. That's People, great. Yeah. It's, it seems like such a reasonable approach when we're faced with a contract that required something that was exceeded by 73 times. Yes. Um, uh, to, invoking ah. the contract reading case is a good one. <laughs> and I'm glad, um, uh, uh, Angela, you brought up Samsung. We're going to wrap up on that. That was that's not an award, but but we would be remiss if we didn't mention that we're waiting on the Samsung Seventh Circuit decision on mass arbitration. Uh, an issue not before the Supreme Court yet, but mass arbitrations where many plaintiffs request individual arbitrations under mandatory arbitration contracts mm -hmm. and the filing costs for the defendant requiring uh, arbitration accordingly soars. Uh, this case with Samsung, Samsung lost in lower court. It was told to pay initial filing fees to the AAA, which is managing its disputes, their consumer disputes. And the the fees were like $4 million, but that's not what the case is about. That's nothing. Even if the total number of plaintiffs, which I believe is into the five figures, um, even if they, uh, uh, many of those don't survive Samsung's uh, aggressive challenges, you're still going to bring that filing fee into tens of millions of dollars. That, again, that's not an award. That's a filing fee to get to arbitration. Um, it seems as though eventually one of these might get up to the Supreme Court. I don't think Samsung or any of the other cases that have been out there want it to go any further than it already is. They want to settle it out and come up with a way to resolve them. Of course, I full disclosure, the CPR Institute, which runs this YouTube channel, has a procedure for dealing with mass claims, right. as does JAMS, which have revised theirs recently, as yeah. does the AAA, which has revised theirs recently. But the bottom and line new era. Yet more. In New Era, I'm sorry, in New Era as well, which we reported in Alternatives on New Era's work in this as well. Um, so I'll throw it all open to you, Rick. I, I will start, start with you um, and, and give everybody else the last words. You had, had, had raised Walgreens and Samsung. Your thoughts on mass arbitration as being a big key issue for us to watch down the road. I think it's inevitable that this is going to draw appellate uh, review and probably petitions for cert to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, these issues are involving, again, massive numbers of people, massive numbers uh, in terms of deposits. Don't forget, Uber sued the AAA over $94 million in deposits, uh, and a number of other companies have done the same thing. The Courts have been pretty unsympathetic uh, to the companies who imposed arbitration. One judge in California said, you're being hoist on your own petard. You mm -hmm. drafted the language. You can draft better language in the future. And let's not forget, we also have ERISA cases bubbling up with clear circuit splits on arbitrability of ERISA disputes. And so that's going to come up uh, as well. Uh, you have the mass arbitration as a massive problem, no puns intended. Uh, what do you do? Uh, New Era, CPR, JAMS, AAA have all tried to come up with uh, particular procedures to either bellwether or do some other way of dealing with these in batches. But as the argument went in one of the uh, cases uh, in 
regarding batches, uh, if the arbitration administrator uh, spent the next 50 years, it still could not get through all of the batches that their rules would suggest were required. And where's the justice in that for any of the parties? So you it's have, gonna come up again and again. You have on both sides of that Samsung case, the best, arb not the best, but some of the best arbitration lawyers and best arbitration minds yes. in the country from the plaintiff side and from the defense side. And both sides have said, it, 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 if not in the Samsung case, then in these variety of cases involving the delivery companies and all in California, that the other side is gaming it to to their advantage. Oh, yes. That's yeah. why, uh, you know, from the defense <clears throat> perspective, that's why Samsung is challenging so many of the filings and some of them are falling off. And that's why on the plaintiff side, the plaintiffs have gone over and been very public about the fact that some of them won't survive because not everybody is a consumer that has a right to arbitration. Right. But you are still leaving thousands and thousands of claimants with contracts that say it's mandatory and they have to arbitrate it which again let's before we get to the arbitrations let's get to the filing fees alone yeah. um and the games, amazon the, abandoning the, arbitration the gamesmanship though i mean it's if you've got attorneys who are lining up and finding these consumers and and for lack of a better term really orchestrating these filings in order to get a company like Samsung to pay these tens of thousands of dollars for these arbitration fees, you know, it's, it's gamesmanship. I mean, they're not looking at the, the critical issues. It's a way for them to really hurt the company, you know, and to really stick it to the company by having them pay all this money. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce report calls it a shakedown. Uh, yes. I don't necessarily mm -hmm. agree with that, but it clearly is making companies have to look of how much do they want to spend to enjoy the arbitration procedure. And that's why I think we're seeing lawyers who previously were extremely hostile to class action saying, wait a second, there's a better way to do this. And it was the class action that we abandoned years ago in favor of arbitration. Uh, so, you know, it, it's all coming in a great big circle. That may uh, be the short term answer because there was an important word you threw out there before, Rick, and that was justice. I mean, this is this is not any justice for the customers and no. the companies do not look at uh, fighting with their customers is any sort of resolution. So with nobody satisfied, you know, those, those big law firms, the ones that are on the defense side in these mass arbitrations may find some comfort in, in federal rule 23. I know the ADR providers would hope they find comfort in, in some of the newer mass arbitration procedures as well. Maybe there'll be a mixture of them. I don't know. Or um, it, it may be the courts themselves. I think we'll have a bit of a roadmap that we can come back and talk about uh, down the road, maybe as soon as it comes out from that Seventh Circuit opinion. That that Seventh Circuit opinion may may be the kind of thing that that will put these arbitration programs on a different plane and maybe make the 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 plaintiffs push toward a settlement and, and, and end them for now um, and, and lead to a solution. Uh, because it doesn't seem like this can keep welling up and 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 going unresolved. It is not justice. Uh, Phil, did you want to have a last word? No, I think I, I think you, you guys have all covered it here. <laughs> I uh, uh, and obviously this is an issue we've got to just uh, stay on top of, and uh, and uh, uh, hopefully it'll be interesting to see if the Seventh Circuit can, can provide some some good guidance in terms of, of, uh, of putting it to bed. We will get this posted. Hopefully it won't, won't come out before this is, this is online in the next uh, 24 hours. Uh, Rick, was there anything else you want to add? I, I cut you off a couple of times there. I, I was going to say, I think uh, we will see another spate of arbitration cases going uh, to the Supreme Court on petitions for cert in the ERISA area in mass arbitration and in the uh, issues of rogue awards, where are, how much supervision are the federal courts going to uh, end up being allowed to 
or will need to uh, exercise to ensure arbitration is actually functional. And if it's not going to be functional, I think corporate America is going to step away from it and say enough. Um, you know, the consumers have questioned the uh, validity of arbitration for many, many years. And I will point out something that few people remember, which is there's one industry in America that an agreement to arbitrate is not valid unless it is entered into after the dispute has arisen. And that's for auto dealers. Yes. It comes to uh, uh, disputes with automobile manufacturers. And as counsel for a number of the dealers, we couldn't amend the FAA. So we stuck it in Title 15 as part of the must pass Department of Justice Appropriations Act. So there's one group in America that does not have to arbitrate and that's auto dealers, which is kind of interesting when you consider how many disputes they have with consumers. Isn't that Magnuson Moss? Or, no, or, no, no, we, no. We've created one? our own version oh. specifically <laughs> to uh, exempt dealers from having to go to AAA arbitrations with the manufacturers because we were losing just about every one of them. <laughs> well, one th one thing for Good sure work. is we're not we're not going to be refighting that one in the near future. When we come back, we certainly I think the ERISA case and all uh, um, is something we may be looking at. We also may have further restrictions from Congress in an election year on uh, on the use of arbitration. The Senate, the full Senate has before it a bill on uh, 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 mandatory arbitration in age discrimination cases. Yes. I know because of all of these potential things and a lot of references to some cases I, I haven't even heard of, we will be back well before our fifth anniversary. So I want to thank <laughs> Uh, Rick Faulkner, Phil Lurie Jr., Angela Downs for doing this, and thank everybody for watching. Please wa stay tuned uh, to the YouTube channel, but click the link for the blog, and we'll be updating these things on a timely basis, and we'll let you know when we're turning here. Thank you all. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. It was great.